Volume One, Letters Seven through Twelve of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brook. Letters Seven through Twelve. Read by Kit Nusis as Edward Rivers. Amanda Friday as Arabella Fermor. Letter seven. To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Montreal, August fifteenth. By heavens, Lucy, this is more than man can bear. I was mad to stay so long at Melmoth. There is no resisting this little seducer. Tis shameful in such a lovely woman to have understanding, too. Yet even this I could forgive, had she not that enchanting softness in her manner, which steals upon the soul, and would almost make ugliness itself charm. Were she but vain, one had some chance. But she will take upon her to have no consciousness, at least no apparent consciousness, of her perfection, which is really intolerable. I told her so last night, when she put on such a malicious smile. I believe the little tyrant wants to add me to the list of her slaves, but I was not formed to fill up a train. The woman I love must be so far from giving another the preference that she must have no soul but for me. I am one of the most unreasonable men in the world on this head. She may fancy what she pleases, but I set her and all her attractions at defiance. I have made my escape and shall set off for Quebec in an hour. Flying is, I must acknowledge, a little out of character and unbecoming a soldier, but in these cases it is the very best thing man or woman either can do, when they doubt their powers of resistance. I intend to be ten days going to Quebec. I propose visiting the priests at every village, and endeavouring to get some knowledge of the nature of the country, in order to my intended settlement. Idleness being the root of all evil, and the nurse of love, I am determined to keep myself employed. Nothing can be better suited to my temper than my present design. The pleasure of cultivating lands here is as much superior to what can be found in the same employment in England, as watching the expanding rows and beholding the falling leaves. America is in infancy, Europe in old age. Nor am I very ill qualified for this agreeable task. I have studied the Georgics, and am a pretty enough kind of husbandman as far as theory goes. Nay, I am not sure I shall not be, even in practice, the best gentleman farmer in the province. You may expect soon to hear of me in the Museum Rusticum. I intend to make amazing discoveries in the rural way. I have already found out, by the force of my own genius, two very uncommon circumstances that in Canada, contrary to what we see everywhere else, the country is rich, the capital poor, the hills fruitful, the valleys barren. You see what excellent dispositions I have to be an useful member of society. I had always a strong bias to the study of natural philosophy. Tell my mother how well I am employed, and she cannot but approve my voyage. Assure her, my dear, of my tenderest regard. The chaise is at the door. Adieu, Ed Rivers. The lover is every hour expected. I am not quite sure I should have liked to see him arrive. A third person, you know, on such an occasion, sinks into nothing, and I love, wherever I am, to be one of the figures which strikes the eye. I hate to appear in the background of the picture. Letter 8 To Miss Rivers, Quebec, August 24th You can't think, my dear, what a fund of useful knowledge I have treasured up during my journey from Montreal. This colony is a rich mine yet unopened. I do not mean of gold and silver, but of what are of much more real value, corn and cattle. Nothing is wanting but encouragement and cultivation. The Canadians are at their ease even without labour. Nature is here a bounteous mother, who pours forth her gifts almost unsolicited. Bigotry, stupidity and laziness united have not been able to keep the peasantry poor. I rejoice to find such admirable capabilities where I propose to fix my dominion. I was hospitably entertained by the curés all the way down, though they are in general but ill provided for. The parochial clergy are useful everywhere, but I have a great aversion to monks, those drones in the political hive, whose whole study seems to be to make themselves as useless to the world as possible. Think, too, of the shocking indelicacy of many of them, who make it a point of religion to abjure linen and wear their habits till they drop off. How astonishing that any mind should suppose the deity an enemy to cleanliness! The Jewish religion was hardly anything else. I paid my respects wherever I stopped to the seigneuris of the village. For as to the seigneurs, except two or three, if they had not wives, they would not be worth visiting. 
I am every day more pleased with the woman here, and, if I was gallant, should be in danger of being a convert to the French style of gallantry, which certainly debases the mind much less than ours. But what is all this to my Emily? How I envy Sir George! What happiness has heaven prepared for him, if he has a soul to taste it? I really must not think of her. I found so much delight in her conversation, it was quite time to come away. I am almost ashamed to own how much difficulty I found in leaving her. Do you know I have scarce slept since? This is absurd, but I cannot help it, which, by the way, is an admirable excuse for anything. I have been come but two hours, and I am going to Sillery, to pay my compliments to your friend Miss Firmer, who arrived with her father, who comes to join his regiment, since I left Quebec. I hear there has been a very fine importation of English ladies during my absence. I am sorry I have not time to visit the rest, but I go to-morrow morning to the Indian village for a fortnight, and have several letters to write to-night. Adieu, I am interrupted. Yours, Ed Rivers. Letter 9. To Mrs. Melmoth, Montreal. Quebec, August 24th. I cannot, madam, express my obligation to you for having added a postscript to Major Melmoth's letter. I am sure he will excuse my answering the whole to you. If not, I beg he may know that I shall be very pert about it, being much more solicitous to please you than him, for a thousand reasons too tedious to mention. I thought you had more penetration than to suppose me indifferent. On the contrary, sensibility is my fault, though it is not your little everyday beauties who can excite it. I have admirable dispositions to love, though I am hard to please. In short, I am not cruel, I am only nice. Do but you, or your divine friend, give me leave to wear your chains, and you shall soon be convinced that I can love like an angel when I set in earnest about it. But alas, you are married, and in love with your husband and your friend is in a situation still more unfavourable to a lover's hoax. This is particularly unfortunate, as you are the only two of your bewitching sex in Canada for whom my heart feels the least sympathy. To be plain, but don't tell the little major, I am more than half in love with you both, and if I was the Grand Turk, should certainly fit out a fleet to seize and bring you to my seraglio. There is one virtue I admire extremely in you both. I mean, that humane and tender compassion for the poor men which prompts you to be always seen together. If you appeared separate, where is the hero who could resist either of you? You ask me how I like the French ladies at Montreal. I think them extremely pleasing, and many of them handsome. I thought Madame L. so. Even near you and Miss Montague, which is, I think, saying as much as can be said on the subject. I have just heard by accident that Sir George has arrived at Montreal. Assure Miss Montague no one can be more warmly interested in her happiness than I am. She is the most perfect work of heaven. May she be the happiest. I feel much more on this occasion than I can express. A mind like hers must, in marriage, be exquisitely happy or miserable. My friendship makes me tremble for her, notwithstanding the worthy character I have heard of Sir George. I will defer till another time what I had to say to Major Melmoth. I have the honour to be, madam, yours, etc. Ed Rivers Letter 10 Sillery, August 24. I have been a month arrived, my dear, without having seen your brother, who is at Montreal, but I am told is expected to-day. I have spent my time, however, very agreeably. I know not what the winter may be, but I am enchanted with the beauty of this country in summer. Bold, picturesque, romantic, nature reigns here in all her wanton luxuriance, adorned by a thousand wild graces which mock the cultivated beauties of Europe. The scenery about the town is infinitely lovely, the prospect extensive, and diversified by a variety of hills, woods, rivers, cascades, intermingled with smiling farms and cottages, and bounded by distant mountains which seem to scale the very heavens. The days are much hotter here than in England, but the heat is more supportable from the breezes which always spring up about noon, and the evenings are charming beyond expression. We have much thunder and lightning, but very few instances of their being fatal. The thunder is more magnificent and awful than in Europe, and the lightning brighter and more beautiful. I have seen it of a clear pale purple, resembling the gay tints of the morning. The verdure is equal to that of England, and in the evening acquires an unspeakable beauty from the lucid splendour of the fireflies, sparkling like a thousand little stars on the trees and on the grass. There are two very noble falls of water near Quebec, the Chaudière and Montmorency. The former is a prodigious sheet of water, rushing over the wildest rocks, and forming a scene grotesque, irregular, astonishing. 
the latter, less wild, less irregular, but more pleasing and more majestic, falls from an immense height down the side of a romantic mountain, into the river St. Lawrence, opposite the most smiling part of the island of Orleans, to the cultivated charms of which it forms the most striking and agreeable contrast. The river of the same name, which supplies the cascade of Mount Morency, is the most lovely of all inanimate objects. But why do I call it inanimate? It almost breathes. I no longer wonder at the enthusiasm of Greece and Rome. T'was from objects resembling this their mythology took its rise. It seems the residence of a thousand deities. Paint to yourself a stupendous rock, burst as it were in sunder by the hands of nature, to give passage to a small but very deep and beautiful river, and forming on each side a regular and magnificent wall, crowned with the noblest woods that can be imagined, the sides of these romantic walls adorned with a variety of the gayest flowers, and in many places little streams of the purest water gushing through, and losing themselves in the river below, a thousand natural grottoes in the rock, make you suppose yourself in the abode of the Nereids, as a little island, covered with flowering shrubs, about a mile above the falls, where the river enlarges itself, as if to give it room, seems intended for the throne of the river goddess. Beyond this, the rapids, formed by the irregular projections of the rock, which in some places seem almost to meet, rival in beauty, as they excel in variety, the cascade itself, enclose this little world of enchantment. In short, the loveliness of this fairy scene alone more than pays the fatigues of my voyage, and if I ever murmur at having crossed the Atlantic, remind me that I have seen the river Montmorency. I can give you a very imperfect account of the people here. I have only examined the landscape about Quebec, and have given very little attention to the figures. The French ladies are handsome, but as to the bows, they appear to me not at all dangerous, and one might safely walk in a wood by moonlight with the most agreeable Frenchman here. I am not surprised the Canadian ladies take such pains to seduce our men from us, but I think it a little hard we have no temptation to make reprisals. I am at present at an extreme pretty farm on the banks of the river St. Lawrence. The house stands at the foot of a steep mountain, covered with a variety of trees, forming a verdant sloping wall, which rises in a kind of regular confusion. Shade above shade a woody theatre, and has in front this noble river, on which the ships continually passing present to the delighted eye the most charming moving picture imaginable. I never saw a place so formed to inspire that pleasing lassitude, that divine inclination to saunter, which may not improperly be called the luxurious indolence of the country. I intend to build a temple here to the charming goddess of laziness. A gentleman is just coming down the winding path on the side of the hill, whom by his air I take to be your brother. Adieu, I must receive him. My father is at Quebec. Yours, Arabella Fermor. Your brother has given me a very pleasing piece of intelligence— my friend Emily Montague is at Montreal, and is going to be married to great advantage. I must write to her immediately, and insist on her making me a visit before she marries. She came to America two years ago, with her uncle Colonel Montague, who died here, and I imagined was gone back to England. She is, however, at Montreal with Mrs. Melmoth, a distant relation of her mother's. Adieu, ma très chère. Letter 11 To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Quebec September 10th. I find, my dear, that absence and amusement are the best remedies for a beginning passion. I have passed a fortnight at the Indian village of Lorette, where the novelty of the scene, and the enquiries I have been led to make into their ancient religion and manners, have been of a thousand times more service to me than all the reflection in the world would have been. I will own to you that I stayed too long at Montreal, or rather at Major Melmoth's. To be six weeks in the same house with one of the most amiable, most pleasing of women, was a trying situation to a heart full of sensibility, and of a sensibility which has been hitherto, from a variety of causes, a good deal restrained. I should have avoided the danger from the first, had it appeared to me what it really was, but I thought myself secure in the consideration of her engagements, a defence, however, which I found grow weaker every day. But to my savages, other nations talk of liberty, they possess it, Nothing can be more astonishing than to see a little village of about thirty or forty families, the small remains of the Hurons, almost exterminated by long and continual war with the Iroquois, preserve their independence in the midst of a European colony consisting of seventy thousand inhabitants. Yet the fact is true of the savages of Lorette. They are certain they maintain that independence with a spirit truly noble. One of our company, having said something which an Indian understood as a superstition, that they had been subjects of France, his eyes struck fire. 
He stopped him abruptly, contrary to their respectful and sensible custom of never interrupting the person who speaks. You mistake, brother, said he. We are subjects to no prince. A savage is free all over the world. And he spoke only truth. They are not only free as a people, but every individual is perfectly so. Lord of himself, at once subject and master, a savage knows no superior, a circumstance which has a striking effect on his behavior. Unawed by rank or riches, distinctions unknown amongst his own nation, he would enter as unconcerned, would possess all his powers as freely in the palace of an oriental monarch as in the cottage of the meanest peasant. Tis the species, tis man, tis his equal he respects, without regarding the gaudy trappings, the accidental advantages to which polished nations pay homage. I have taken some pains to develop their present, as well as past, religious sentiments, because the Jesuit missionaries have boasted so much of their conversion, and find they have rather engrafted a few of the most plain and simple truths of Christianity on their ancient superstitions, than exchanged one faith for another. They are baptized and even submit to what they themselves call the yoke of confession, and worship according to the outward forms of the Romish church, the drapery of which cannot but strike minds unused to splendor. But their belief is very little changed, except that the women seem to pay great reverence to the virgin, perhaps because flattering to the sex. They anciently believed in one God, the ruler and creator of the universe, whom they called the Great Spirit and the Master of Life, in the sun as his image and representative, in a multitude of inferior spirits and demons, and in a future state of rewards and punishments, or, to use their own phrase, in a country of souls. They reverence the spirits of their departed heroes, but it does not appear that they paid them any religious adoration. Their morals were more pure, their manners more simple, than those of the Polish nations, except in what regarded the intercourse of the sexes. The young women before marriage were indulged in great libertinism, hid, however, under the most reserved and decent exterior. They held adultery in abhorrence, and with the more reason, as their marriages were dissolvable at pleasure. The missionaries are said to have found no difficulty so great in gaining them to Christianity as that of persuading them to marry for life. They regarded the Christian system of marriage as contrary to the laws of nature and reason, and asserted that, as the Great Spirit formed us to be happy, it was opposing to his will to continue together when otherwise. The sects we have so unjustly excluded from power in Europe have a great share in the Huron government. The chief is chosen by the matrons from amongst the nearest male relations, by the female line of him he is to succeed and is generally an aunt's or sister's son, a custom which, if we examine strictly into the principle on which it is founded, seems a little to contradict what we are told of the extreme chastity of the married ladies. The power of the chief is extremely limited. He seems rather to advise his people as a father than command them as a master. Yet, as his commands are always reasonable, and for the general good, no prince in the world is so well obeyed. They have a supreme council of ancients, into which every man enters, of course, at an age fixed and another of assistance to the chief on common occasions, the members of which are like him elected by the matrons. I am pleased with this last regulation, as women are, beyond all doubt, the best judges of the merit of men, and I should be extremely pleased to see it adopted in England. Canvassing for elections would then be the most agreeable thing in the world, and I am sure the ladies would give their votes on much more generous principles than we do. In the true sense of the word, we are the savages who so impolitely deprive you of the common rights of citizenship, and leave you no power but that of which we cannot deprive you, the resistless power of your charms. By the way, I don't think you are obliged in conscience to obey laws you have had no share in making. Your plea would certainly be at least as good as that of the Americans, about which we every day hear so much. The Hurons have no positive laws, yet being a people not numerous, with a strong sense of honour, and in that state of equality which gives no food to the most tormenting passions of the human heart, and the Council of Ancients having a power to punish atrocious crimes, which power, however, they very seldom find occasion to use, they live together in a tranquillity and order which appears to us surprising. In more numerous Indian nations, I am told, every village has its chief and its councils, and is perfectly independent on the rest, but on great occasions summon a general council to which every village sends deputies. Their language is at once sublime and melodious, but, having much fewer ideas, it is impossible it can be so copious as those of Europe. The pronunciation of the men is guttural, but that of the women extremely soft and pleasing. Without understanding one word of the language, the sound of it is very agreeable to me. Their style, even in speaking French, is bold and metaphorical, 
and I am told is on important occasions extremely sublime. Even in common conversation they speak in figures, of which I have this moment an instance. A savage woman was wounded lately in defending an English family from the drunken rage of one of her nation. I asked her after her wound. It is well, said she. My sisters at Quebec, meaning the English ladies, have been kind to me, and piastres, you know, are very healing. They have no idea of letters, no alphabet, nor is their language reducible to rules. Tis by painting they preserve the memory of the only events which interest them, or that they think worth recording, the conquests gained over their enemies in war. When I speak of their paintings I should not omit that, though extremely rude, they have a strong resemblance to the Chinese, a circumstance which struck me the more, as it is not the style of nature. Their dances also, the most lively pantomimes I ever saw, and especially the dance of peace, exhibit a variety of attitudes resembling the figures on Chinese fans, nor have their features and complexion less likeness to the pictures we see of the Tartars, as their wandering manner of life, before they became Christians, was the same. If I thought it necessary to suppose they were not natives of the country, and that America was peopled later than the other quarters of the world, I should imagine them the descendants of Tartars, as nothing can be more easy than their passage from Asia, from which America is probably not divided, or, if it is, by a very narrow channel. But I leave this to those who are better informed, being a subject on which I honestly confess my ignorance. I have already observed that they retain most of their ancient superstitions. I should particularize their belief in dreams, of which folly even repeated disappointments cannot cure them. They have also an unlimited faith in their powwowers, or conjurers, of whom there is one in every Indian village, who is at once physician, orator, and divine, and who is consulted as an oracle on every occasion. As I happened to smile at the recital a savage was making of a prophetic dream, from which he assured us of the death of an English officer whom I knew to be alive, "'You Europeans,' said he, "'are the most unreasonable people in the world. You laugh at our belief in dreams, and yet expect us to believe things a thousand times more incredible.' Their general character is difficult to describe, made up of contrary and even contradictory qualities. They are indolent, tranquil, quiet, humane in peace, active, restless, cruel, ferocious in war, courteous, attentive, hospitable, and even polite when kindly treated, haughty, stern, vindictive when they are not, and their resentment is the more to be dreaded as they hold it a point of honour to dissemble their sense of an injury till they find an opportunity to revenge it. They are patient of cold and heat, of hunger and thirst, even beyond all belief when necessity requires, passing whole days, and often three or four days together, without food, in the woods, when on the watch for an enemy, or even on their hunting parties yet indulging themselves in their feasts even to the most brutal degree of intemperance. They despise death, and suffer the most excruciating tortures not only without a groan, but with an air of triumph, singing their death song, deriding their tormentors, and threatening them with the vengeance of their surviving friends, yet hold it honourable to fly before an enemy that appears the least superior in number or force. Deprived by their extreme ignorance and that indolence which nothing but their ardour for war can surmount, of all the conveniences, as well as elegant refinement of polished life, strangers to the softer passions, love being with them on the same footing as amongst their fellow tenants of the woods, their lives appear to me rather tranquil than happy. They have fewer cares, but they also have much fewer enjoyments than fall to our share. I am told, however, that, though insensible to love, they are not without affections, are extremely awake to friendship, and passionately fond of their children. They are of a copper colour, which is rendered more unpleasing by a quantity of coarse red on their cheeks, but the children, when born, are of a pale silver white, perhaps their indelicate custom of greasing their bodies, and their being so much exposed to the air and sun, even from infancy, may cause that total change of complexion, which I know not how otherwise to account for. Their hair is black and shining, the women's very long, parted at the top, and combed back, tied behind, and often twisted with a thong of leather which they think very ornamental. The dress of both sexes is a close jacket, reaching to their knees, with spatter dashes, all of coarse blue cloth, shoes of deerskin, embroidered with porcupine quills, and sometimes with silver spangles, and a blanket thrown across their shoulders, and fastened before with a kind of bodkin, with necklaces and other ornaments of beads or shells. They are in general tall, well-made, and agile to the last degree, have a lively imagination, a strong memory, and as far as their interests are concerned, are very dexterous politicians. 
Their address is cold and reserved, but their treatment of strangers and the unhappy infinitely kind and hospitable. A very worthy priest, with whom I am acquainted at Quebec, was some years since shipwrecked in December on the island of Anticosti, after a variety of distresses, not difficult to be imagined on an island without inhabitants, during the severity of a winter even colder than that of Canada, he, with the small remains of his companions who survived such complicated distress, early in the spring reached the mainland in their boat, and wandered to a cabin of savages, the ancient of which, having heard his story, bid him enter, and liberally supplied their wants. Approach, brother, said he. The unhappy have a right to our assistance. We are men, and cannot but feel for the distresses which happen to men. A sentiment which has a strong resemblance to a celebrated one in a Greek tragedy. You will not expect more from me on this subject, as my residence here has been short, and I can only be said to catch a few marking features flying. I am unable to give you a picture at full length. Nothing astonishes me so much as to find their manners so little changed by their intercourse with the Europeans. They seem to have learnt nothing of us but excess in drinking. The situation of the village is very fine, on an eminence, gently rising to a thick wood at some distance, a beautiful little serpentine river in front, on which are a bridge, a mill, and a small cascade, at such a distance as to be very pleasing objects from their houses, and a cultivated country, intermixed with little woods lying between them and Quebec from which they are distant only nine very short miles. What a letter have I written! I shall quit my post of historian to your friend Miss Firmer. The ladies love writing much better than we do, and I should perhaps be only just if I said they write better. Adieu, Ed Rivers. Letter 12. To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Quebec, September 12th. I yesterday morning received a letter from Major Melmoth to introduce to my acquaintance Sir George Clayton, who brought it. He wanted no other introduction to me than his being dear to the most amiable woman breathing. In virtue of that claim he may command every civility, every attention in my power. He breakfasted with me yesterday. We were two hours alone, and had a great deal of conversation. We afterwards spent the day together very agreeably, on a party of pleasure in the country. I am going with him this afternoon to visit Miss Firmer to whom he has a letter from the divine Emily, which he is to deliver himself. He is very handsome, but not of my favourite style of beauty, extremely fair and blooming, with fine features, light hair and eyes, his countenance not absolutely heavy, but inanimate, and to my taste insipid, finely made, not ungenteel, but without that easy air of the world which I prefer to the most exact symmetry without it. In short, he is what the country ladies in England call a sweet pretty man, he dresses well, has the finest horses, and the handsomest libraries I have seen in Canada. His manner is civil but cold, his conversation sensible but not spirited. He seems to be a man rather to approve than to love. Will you excuse me if I say, he resembles the form my imagination paints of Prometheus's man of clay, before he stole the celestial fire to animate him? Perhaps I scrutinize him too strictly. Perhaps I am prejudiced in my judgment by the very high idea I had formed of the man whom Emily Montague could love. I will own to you that I thought it impossible for her to be pleased with mere beauty, and I cannot even now change my opinion. I shall find some latent fire, some hidden spark, when we are better acquainted. I intend to be very intimate with him, to endeavour to see into his very soul. I am hard to please in a husband for my Emily. He must have spirit, he must have sensibility, or he cannot make her happy. He thanked me for my civility to Miss Montague. Do you know I thought him impertinent? and I am not yet sure he was not so, though I saw he meant to be polite. He comes. Our horses are at the door. Adieu. Yours, Ed Rivers. Eight in the evening. We are returned. I every hour like him less. There were several ladies, French and English, with Miss Firmer, all on the rack to engage the baronet's attention. You have no notion of the effect of a title in America. To do the ladies justice, however, he really looked very handsome. The ride and the civilities he received from a circle of pretty women, for they were well chose, gave a glow to his complexion extremely favourable to his desire of pleasing, which, through all his calmness, it was impossible not to observe. He even attempted once or twice to be lively, but failed. Vanity itself could not inspire him with vivacity, yet vanity is certainly his ruling passion, if such a piece of still life can be said to have any passions at all. What a charm, my dear Lucy, is their insensibility! "'Tis the magnet which attracts all to itself. Virtue may command esteem, understanding and talents admiration, beauty a transient desire, 
but tis sensibility alone which can inspire love. Yet the tender, the sensible Emily Montague? No, my dear, tis impossible. She may fancy she loves him, but it is not in nature, unless she extremely mistakes his character. His approbation of her, for he cannot feel a livelier sentiment, may at present, when with her, raise him a little above his natural vegetative state, but after marriage he will certainly sink into it again. If I have the least judgment in men, he will be a cold, civil, inattentive husband, a tasteless, insipid, silent companion, a tranquil, frozen, unimpassioned lover. His insensibility will secure her from rivals. His vanity will give her all the drapery of happiness. Her friends will congratulate her choice. She will be the envy of her own sex. Without giving positive offence, he will every moment wound, because he is a stranger to all the fine feelings of a heart like hers. She will seek in vain the friend, the lover, she expected. Yet, scarce knowing of what to complain, she will accuse herself of caprice, and be astonished to find herself wretched with the best husband in the world. I tremble for her happiness. I know how few of my own sex are to be found who have the lively sensibility of yours, and of those few how many wear out their hearts by a life of gallantry and dissipation, and bring only apathy and disgust into marriage. I know few men capable of making her happy, but this Sir George— my Lucy, I have not patience. Did I tell you all the men here are in love with your friend Belle Firmer? The women all hate her, which is an unequivocal proof that she pleases the other sex. End of letters 7 through 12